Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. The financial system is in trouble. Banks are failing. The money supply is expanding. Inflation remains stubborn. What's a real estate investor to think of all this? Well, today on the show, we have a good friend and a real estate investor who spends most of his time thinking about and educating on this topic and more. It's going to be a great show today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Having trouble finding deals where the numbers make sense? Invest in an asset class that delivers cash flow to you in good times and bad, and where most of that cash flow is tax-free. I'm Dave Zook. Many of you have heard me speak at Real Estate Guys events or heard me on their podcast. My team is a top five ATM operator in the country, and right now accredited investors can make cash flow returns well into the double digits and get huge tax deductions. For your free report on this lucrative asset class, email atm at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and joining me in the co-host seat, it's our financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, things are crazy. Oh, my goodness. It seems like every week there's more and more to talk about. But this whole bank implosion thing, I know you did a Facebook Live on it, Ross. We've had lots of people reaching out about it. Uh, our friend Robert Kiyosaki had an emergency podcast. I mean, things are definitely changing fast. Well, I think that anybody who has been around long enough to remember 2008 as an active investor, and there's, you know, it's 15 years. So there's people that were 20 years old, college not paying attention, that don't really remember investing in that type of an environment. And they've never seen a financial system collapse. I remember when 2008 happened, I, my partner in the mortgage business had been in the mortgage business the last time the uh, savings and loan crisis came. And he goes, you know, it's just like a light switch. When the credit markets collapse, it's just, it goes from there's loans and things are happening to nothing. It's a ghost town. And I couldn't comprehend. He tried to warn me. Robert Kiyosaki was talking to us about what was going on in the financial system back uh, approaching 2008, warning us about the impact it would have on real estate being so dependent upon the influx of capital mortgage money credit and sensitivity to interest rates. And of course, I didn't have any macro education. I didn't have any understanding of how the plumbing worked or how the money made it to Main Street. Didn't think it mattered. Thought I was safely insulated. Hey, I'm a Main Street guy. I left Wall Street behind a long time ago. And uh, we thought we were safe. And you know, little did we know when that bomb went off, it took out the mortgage company. It wiped out all the equity. It made all the credit lines go away. All of a sudden, you go from being liquid to having no liquidity, no operating capital, and you're shell-shocked. It took me about 90 days after that happened just to realize, okay, there's no quick fix. This is going to take some time. Of course, we found the opportunity in that in private capital and syndication, and that changed our business. But it put me on this crusade to understand what happened, why it happened, how to recognize this, the signs, and who is really qualified? Who knew? You know, Peter Schiff is a guy that we sought out as a result of that. And, and we started finding people that really understood these things and paid attention and followed them. And uh, the last 15 years, I, I can tell you, I'm not surprised about what's happening. You know, I'm not happy to see it, but it's not shocking. I feel much, much better prepared. Hopefully many of our listeners are too. Uh, but I'd encourage you, if this is your first rodeo, just pay attention. Uh, things can change very, very quickly, and nobody knows exactly what's going to happen, but there's a lot happening. Well, back then, you were active in the mortgage business, had a lot of loan officers working for you. In fact, I remember you were at a conference, and it was sponsored. The night's gala event was sponsored by one of the big wholesale lenders, and they went out of business that day. That day. It went from being a gala black tie to a wake. And every, it was just like going to a funeral. Everybody was crying. They lost their jobs. I mean, literally watching the industry implode in, in a very short time. So many of the companies that were you'd, you'd place your business with. Because the way the mortgage business works, you, go out, you originate the loans and then you package up the loans and you sell them off to Wall Street. And the people that were in that conduit of moving money from Wall Street to Main Street and moving mortgages from Main Street back to Wall Street, that whole system just broke. 
And we had 100 loans in our pipeline back then, and we couldn't place a single one. Every single lender we went to was out of business. And the you know you go from having a very successful mortgage practice to having no income and nothing but overhead, and it can take you down real fast. Boy, it sure can. And I think that's really the topic today. People are concerned with what's happened at Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank, and is my money safe and all of those things. And I think before we can even attempt to answer those questions, we need to have a, a better understanding understanding of how the banking system works. Our guest today is no banker, and he is actually a macroeconomic guy who is like you, Russ, self-taught. But we have learned so much hanging around with this guy, and you're going to learn a ton today. When we come back, you'll meet the rebel capitalist. George Gammon is with us on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Hear ye, hear ye. Registration is open for The Real Estate Guys 21st Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year is the editor of the Gold Newsletter, Brian London, real estate developers Beth Clifford and Victor Menashe, and Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner, Kyle Wilson. Also back from Peak Prosperity, Dr. Chris Martinson and the rebel capitalist, George Gammon. And joining us live and in person for his 11th Investor Summit, Ken McElroy. Plus two brand new faculty members we can't even mention yet. It all begins June 6th in beautiful Ambergris Key, Belize. Visit Summit on Sand to get all the details and reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to summitonsand.com and make plans to spend a week with the real estate guys, George Gammon, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 21st Annual Investor Summit on Sand. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hello, this is Dave Leniger, co-founder of REMAX International. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Now in our 27th year of broadcast, we're talking today about the elephant in the room. What's happening with the banking system? How do we understand it? Is our money safe? What is an investor to do? Let's welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program, our good friend, the rebel capitalist, George Gammon. Hey, George. Hey, thanks for having me back, Robert and Russ. It's always... Fun to talk. Yes, it is. I feel like I talk to you practically every day since your prolific podcasting seems to uh, hit my uh, my phone all the time. And uh, <laughs> thanks to you, I'm exercising more. So, but uh, really appreciate all the work you do. If folks haven't uh, haven't heard you, George, I think just to earn some credibility in the real estate guy's audience, before you were a big macro guy, you were a real estate guy and you're still active in real estate. Give us the nickel tour on your background in investment property. Yeah, I was an entrepreneur for many years. I retired in 2012 and I wanted to invest my own money. I didn't want to delegate that. And my favorite investor was Jim Rogers. And so he always said, buy low, sell high. So I just looked around and said, okay, what's cheap? I want to buy things cheap and sell them expensive, just like Jim Rogers. And at the time that was real estate. <laughs> so in 2012, that was my initiation. I went all in and uh, fortunately did pretty well. But then I started to expand that knowledge base overseas. And I started investing in South America. And since 2014, I've been investing in Medellin, Colombia. In 2019, I started a TV show down here around my uh, properties, just like an HGTV show, yep. kind of like a fix and flip or fix and rent type of deal. 
that turned into the YouTube channel because we got done with season one. I had all the editors and all the camera people, all the awesome uh, brain power behind the TV show, wanted to keep them working. And so we started that YouTube channel initially is about real estate. My passion has always been macroeconomics. So we started doing a couple videos on that topic, which I didn't think anyone would watch. But uh, oddly enough, those got all the views, which was a perfect fit because that's what I really like to talk about. Then the next thing you know, we've got a couple channels now. I think we have over five or 550,000 subscribers. Uh, we've got a podcast, which you mentioned. It gets about a million downloads a month. We've got a live event and uh, it's just expanding and I couldn't be happier. You know, it reminds me of the first time I met Ron Paul and he said the reason he got into politics is just so he could have people to talk to about his ideas about Austrian economics. And it really resonated with me because that's the exact same reason that I continue to do the YouTube channel. It just gives me an outlet to talk about these ideas with really smart people like you guys. Love that. Well, uh, we'll tell folks before they're done how they can uh, find you if they haven't yet. But uh, one of the things I appreciate about you is your methodical nature of looking under the hood, figuring out how these things work without a classical background in that. And this is a time where people are uncertain, unsure, is my bank safe, all of that. I think before we talk about what happened at Silicon Valley Bank, maybe just take us through you know, the macro picture on how banking really works and maybe the parts people usually don't understand. I think I think the biggest mistake people make is they think that when they give their money to a bank, the bank takes that money and puts it in a vault. And then when they come, you know, to get the money that uh, 10% of it is there. And therefore, you know, assuming that they don't have too many people ask for their money, the bank just goes over to the vault, hands it to them, and that's it. Uh, what they don't understand is when you give your money to a bank, you're lending it to them. They're not putting it in a vault. They're taking that money and they are utilizing it uh, in whichever way they want to, uh, whether that's buying treasuries, buying mortgage-backed securities, whether that's taking that money and lending it to a, a cash flow negative tech company that's most likely going to go out of business. Uh, that's what people have to realize. And it just really astonishes me that if you had a million dollars and someone asked you to borrow it in like a real estate deal, you'd do some proper and some serious due diligence. You bet. Assuming that was a significant portion of your net worth uh, because you'd want to get paid back. You'd want to know, hey, what's the collateral? What happens if I don't get paid back? Uh, but for some reason, people don't look at banks in that same capacity. Uh, they just say, well, who has the highest interest rate and who has the most, you know, the most friendly customer service? <laughs> and unfortunately, that's not the way to do proper due diligence on a bank. In fact, if you want just a quick tip, especially now, you probably want to gravitate towards banks who are actually paying you less, not more, uh, because the higher interest rate they're paying you, the more desperate they are for your deposits. And that means the more risky they are. And so I would kind of use that as, as a little bit of a gauge for the average Joe and Jane, that if you've got one bank that's only willing to pay you 50 basis points on a checking account, you may say, oh, that's terrible. Uh, I can go over to this other online bank and get 3%. Okay, <laughs> just keep in mind, uh, you are taking a massive, massive amount of risk for that additional 2.5%. And in today's environment, it might be more prudent uh, to just take the 50 basis points. Will Rogers famously said, I'm not that interested in the return on my investment as I am the return <laughs> of my investment, right? Yeah. And so when we put our money somewhere, we want it to be safe. And yet you bring up the exact point, your money isn't sitting in the vault. And let's face it, over the years, prudent banking practices, you know, great bankers, they are careful and meticulous and diligent, and they lend out on things like car loans and house loans, and those are at a higher rate than they pay savings, and they make that arbitrage that's spread on the difference. And that all works great right up until it doesn't, until they get starved for yield, until they take more risk. So I, I know you've delved into this a, a bit. Can you help explain what happened specifically at Silicon Valley Bank? Yeah, it was pretty much negligence. So I know a lot of people are looking at charts on zero hedge and whatnot and see all these assets on the bank's balance sheets that are underwater and saying, well, look at their capital. Therefore, the entire banking system has negative equity. Uh, but what that fails to recognize is that most good banks, 
even if they do have a huge bond portfolio that might be slightly underwater because the Fed has raised interest rates so much, uh, they're going to hedge out the asset side of their balance sheet. Uh, just to put that in very simple terms, let's say they've got a million dollars on the asset side of their balance sheet, and it's all U.S. treasuries that they purchased at 1%, and the Fed starts raising rates. Well, what any rational banker is going to do? In fact, uh, a lot of my friends in the macro space have said this is something that a summer intern would know uh, at a bank, uh, that you go out there and you buy uh, interest rate swaps or you buy some sort of derivative that would offset that loss if interest rates do go up. So if you've got that million, the million dollars in assets, if it goes down to 900,000, then you're most likely gonna have a hedge, maybe on or off your balance sheet, that's gonna increase in value by the amount that the bonds lost. And that's what Silicon Valley Bank or any bank really should have done. Um, but it's not just with the asset side of the balance sheet, it's with the liability side as well. I think something like 95% of Silicon Valley Bank's depositors were over the FDIC limit. Yeah. Uh, so what that means is if you do have some issues, you're gonna get people that take their money and run for obvious reasons. Where Bank of America, if I'm not mistaken, has about 70% of their total deposits under the FDIC limit. So those people are, are far less likely to take their money and, and, and move it to another bank. And in uh, the fact that many depositors had over the FDIC limit is unbelievable in and of itself. That's negligence on their side as well, which is why I'm very, very against one of the ma many reasons I'm very against these, what were effectively bailouts. But the Silicon Valley Bank, you've got to look at this. Okay, you've got all these depositors that are over the FDIC limit, and they're these tech companies. Well, anyone that's you know not living under a rock for the last six months, every single time you see a headline on CNBC or Bloomberg, it's tech company layoffs. Whether it's this tech company, Facebook, Amazon, Google, it's all just lay you know the tech space is doing very very poorly uh, for a variety of reasons. Right. Uh, probably most specifically because the Fed has been raising interest rates, so they, these growth stocks are getting crushed. Uh, they're they're really struggling. So, okay, if you've got all these depositors that are these tech companies that are really struggling, do you think their deposits are going to go up or down? Way down. <laughs> it's like, hello, uh, most likely their bank account balance is going to go down, which means that you have to transfer those deposits somewhere else. And therefore you have to sell assets to sell the assets to match up with the liabilities that you're sending to another commercial bank. So when this first happened, I really couldn't believe that a bank would put themselves in that type of situation from a standpoint of of their entire balance sheet. Not you know most people get focused on the assets, but it was a mismanagement of the liability side as well. So then the question becomes well how many other banks made these very very foolish mistakes? And I you know I think there's an argument for full reserve banking and, and I've often kind of criticized fractional reserve I think it's a good debate to have, but this is not a result of fractional reserve banking. I, I want to make that clear. This is a result of uh, people at the bank just being completely, completely asleep at the wheel. Or it could also be a, a matter of their risk management team being 20 years old during the GFC, just like Russ was saying earlier. And they have never seen an environment where interest rates have gone up, uh, not to mention go up at the fastest rate that we've ever seen in the United States. So I don't think a lot of them had any playbook for this. So it could just be negligence combined with a complete lack of experience. And therefore, you know, the question becomes, okay, well, this is a problem that they shouldn't have to begin with, but it doesn't mean that other banks don't have it due to the same reasons, negligence and inexperience. Now, which banks out there fall into that category? I don't know. And then, you know, they set up a, a new facility. They, the Fed, set up a new four-letter facility. I think it's a banking term, funding program, something like that. So this should uh, reduce some of the additional risks out there, but it doesn't solve the problem. And I think that's what's crucial for people to understand because you see this in the news, you see it on CNBC or Bloomberg, and I think the average Joe and Jane says, okay, well, this is just a problem with this bank. What they don't understand is that's like having a brain tumor and focusing on the fact you've got a headache. Uh, the problem is not that you've got a headache. Uh, that's just a symptom. 
Right. You have to look deeper than that. So the real problem here is that the global monetary system is broken. It broke in 2008. It's never been fixed. And it completely depends on one thing, confidence. So when that confidence is gone, uh, the Fed cannot replace that to a significant degree. Now, it might be able to put some duct tape over it, uh, some Band-Aids, but it doesn't really get to the root of the problem. So in the mainstream media, I'm sure a lot of your listeners always hear about, well, they have a lack of liquidity, a lack of liquidity, a lack of liquidity. There is no lack of liquidity uh, because banks can create as much money as they want. Uh, banks can, you know, there were several banks, or any bank really uh, could have bailed out or given quote unquote liquidity or a loan to Silicon Valley Bank, but they didn't. Why? Because it's not that there's a lack of liquidity or balance sheet capacity within the banking system. It's there's a lack of confidence that they're going to get paid back. Once you understand that, you go and you look at all of these actions that the central planners have taken since 2008, and then you ask yourself, okay, did that increase confidence overall in the global monetary system and therefore the global economy, or did it decrease it? So let's go through that. We've got all these QE, one, two, three. Well, if QE works, and why do you have to do five of them? Yeah. Okay, well, that's going to decrease confidence. You got uh, Operation Twist. You've got QT, and then that blew up in their face. You've got the repo spike. Then you come in with COVID, and the government locks everybody in a cage, completely shuts down the global economy. Okay, so is that going to increase confidence uh, that whatever fix we have is sustainable? Absolutely not. It's going to decrease. So when you have all those things, it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts, right? You have all those things that add up that pretty soon something gives, something breaks, and that's going to be exacerbated by the Fed raising rates. But my whole point and kind of going off on this tangent is hopefully to help your viewers understand that this isn't just about the banks. It's not just about Credit Suisse. It's not just about Silicon Valley Bank or Signature. It's about the fact that confidence is evaporating very, very quickly. And therefore, you're most likely going to see more problems, whether those problems arise in the banking system or somewhere else, I don't know. But it's very similar to a tsunami. That's the analogy that I've used. You can't really see it when it's out there in the deep waters. Um, but you've got some buoys out there with technology. You know, you've got those things that are underwater that can track that tsunami that's coming toward the shore. Right. And that's in, in economic terms or financial terms, that's called the bond market and the inversion of the yield curve. That's that buoy that's out there that can measure the velocity or the power, the strength of that tsunami that's coming out you, uh, at you at 500 miles per hour, that if you were on a boat out there at sea, you wouldn't even notice it. it would go, you couldn't even see it. It would go right under you. You'd be like, huh, it might be a little wave or something, but you most likely wouldn't. You only notice when it starts getting very close to the shore. So the bond market and the inversion of the curve started at least nine months ago. Yep. And it got more inverted and more inverted. And it you started to see more and more and more of these cracks, more of these signs, which for anyone that was paying attention, you realize that there was a tsunami coming right at us. Now, you don't know where that tsunami is going to hit. You don't know how powerful it's going to be. You don't know how it's going to play out, but you know that that's coming. And so my point is this tsunami is still coming at us. This is just the beginning. Uh, this is, what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank and what we saw with Signature or Credit Suisse, that was not the tsunami. That was just kind of some more of those warning signs that were coming from those buoys. It's still coming at us at 500 miles per hour. And I think that's what people really need to recognize. And how do you do that? Uh, you pay diligent attention to the yield curve. And if you want to, I can explain that further. Well, in fact, you uh, cover this well on uh, your uh, podcast and your videos. But uh, take, us, take us through it because people hear about yield curve inversion and maybe they understand that has to do with the return rates based on a timeline. But that's about as far as it goes. So, so take us through why that's so important, why it's such a critical indicator. Yeah, the simplest yield curve to look at is the two-year and the 10-year. Yep. The Fed and some of the financial types look at the three-month and the the 10 year to get a little bit better timing but most people they just look at the two years so as you would imagine the longer you lend money to someone the higher the interest rate yep higher the risk uh, that they're not going to pay you back the higher the risk of inflation 
they're going to pay you back with devalued currency units. So when you get an environment where the longer you lend money to someone, the less interest you charge, that's highly unusual. Yeah, That is not an indicator of health in the global economy. What that means is so many big money institutions out there believe that the interest rates will go lower in the future because of some sort of crisis situation, recession, economic depression, et cetera, that they're trying to hedge out the long side of their portfolio. So if they've got all these stocks, if they've got uh, you know a lot of real estate, something like that, they're going to go ahead and also buy bonds. So if their real estate or if their stocks go down, most likely the price of those bonds go up, the yield goes down. So you see a lot of demand on the long end of the curve for people kind of hedging their bets, if you will. So what that does, because there's so much demand for people in these very sophisticated financial institutions, there's so much demand for them hedging their book by buying treasuries. You see the yield on the 10 year or the long end of the curve go lower than the front end of the curve. In this case, we're using that two year and that 10 year. Yep. And so why does this matter or how powerful is this indicator? If we go back to 1950, it's predicted every single recession we've had. It has a 100% accuracy. Now, there's only one time that it inverted and it did not produce a recession. That was in 1965. But I'd like to point out that although it didn't create a recession, GDP went from 10% down to 0.2%. Wow. So a decrease in GDP by 10%. Now, technically, is that a recession? No. But if you ask the guy in the street, it has the exact same impact. It's just that GDP didn't go negative. So in my opinion, the yield curve has 100% accuracy. Now, what it can't tell you is, is when you're going to get that recession. And so there you have to look at other things, uh, such as you know the use of the Fed's discount window, uh, the use of swap lines. And also you have to look at the front end of the curve and look at the delta between like the four week treasury and reverse repo. Now I know that gets very technical and I can explain those, but getting back to the yield curve, we saw this invert back nine months ago and it got more inverted and more inverted and more inverted. And uh, again, this is that buoy that's out in the middle of the ocean that's sending this signal to anyone that's paying attention that, hey, this tsunami is coming at you. And now most people, they don't pay any attention to it. And you see in the mainstream media, well, you don't see any more, but in the mainstream media, they say, oh, the yield curve is dead. Unemployment rate is at all-time lows. The economy is booming. The economy is on fire. We've got nothing to worry about. Uh, you know, And you still have these YOLO trades out there. But for the, the smart money, uh, they're hedging their book, like we said, and therefore yields are going down even further. Uh, the 10 year, you know, went from, I think, 4.3 down to 3.5. And just last week or the week prior, we had the two year go down at an unprecedented pace. Yeah. Uh, let me give you some context there. Uh, right around Silicon Valley, uh, bank blow up, you had the two year treasury yield go down by over 100 basis points, over 100 basis points. Now, for most of your viewers that don't pay any attention, they, they, I don't know what that means, but during 1987, a Black Monday, I'm sure most people remember that, the two-year treasury yield went down by 100 basis points. 9-11, terrorist attacks, the two-year treasury went down by 63 basis points. And during Silicon Valley, from peak to trough, it went down by about 120 basis points. So that, that gives you an indication of the fear, the risk off, what the market sees coming uh, at us very, very quickly. That's just an example of how you can not only look at the yield curve, but look at what the interest rates are doing within the yield curve to have uh, even more of those signals or more of maybe the timing component behind you know what may play out in the future. But uh, what most people need to focus on now is not necessarily the inversion of the curve, it's actually the steepening of the curve. Because if you look at charts, you see that the recession or economic depression, global financial crisis, whatever, 
it almost always comes after the yield curve um, uninverts. I'm not sure if that's a word, but <laughs> <laughs> once the yield curve is no longer inverted. So what you see is you see if you're looking at a chart of like the uh, the the ten year minus the the two year or the two year minus the 10 year, excuse me. Uh, then you see that go negative. And then that's not when you get the recession, when it starts going back up and goes above zero again, steepens out uninverts. That's usually when you get, uh, you know, that right hook from Tyson. So that's what people need to be focusing on right now. I think as we speak, the yield on the two year is about 4.1, maybe 4.2. It did last week, it did dip down as low as 3.7, if my memory serves me right. And the 10 year was at 3.5, roughly. So it got very close to uninverting last week. Now it's kind of inverted a little bit more now. But, you know, this is a gradual process. And when people really need to start paying attention or when people really need to start, I, I don't want to use the word panic because that's that's not the, the, the right word. But when people really need to be uh, the most risk averse, let's say, is when they they see that uh, two-year treasury go back down below sort of the yield, the 10-year treasury. And I think we'll probably see that and maybe... Uh, at least the next couple months. And, um, you know, to add to that, you look at the prediction for the Fed funds rate and prior to Silicon Valley Bank, you know, the what they call the neutral rate, the market was predicting, which means that, you know, what rate is the Fed going to get up to before they pivot? Uh, that was like 5.3. I know BlackRock even came out and said 6%. And then as soon as you get Silicon Valley, like a week later, it's the the predictions now, if you look at the market curves, uh, are for the Fed not only to pivot, but by the end of this year to go down by 120 basis points. So to so not just uh, you know, stop and stay here at 4.75, whatever they do today, but to go down and to reduce rates by a hundred or 120 basis points by the end of 2023. So that should, uh, in and of itself, I think should make people pause and kind of take a step back and say, wait a minute, you know, how much risk am I exposed to here with my personal portfolio? Uh, another thing I'd mention is going back to that discount window. Uh, the swap lines and the four-year, that gets a little, or the four-month, excuse me, four-week, that gets a little esoteric, and I'm happy to dive into that. But the discount window is something that everyone can really understand. Yeah. And this is uh, the facility that the Fed has available or banks that basically are, are really, really in trouble. And uh, they've got assets on their balance sheet. They need the, the liquidity. No other banks will give it to them, although they have the balance sheet capacity. And they've got no other option. And uh, why is the discount window so bad? Uh, because it comes along with a stigma. So if you're a bank that goes to the discount window, all the other banks are going to know that. Yeah. And it's going to be very unlikely that they're going to do business with you moving forward. Why would they? You know, if you were a bank and you knew that one of your uh, associates or one of your uh, fellow banks went to the discount window, uh, just hat in hand, are you going to be eager to go out there and, you know, do business with them moving forward? Absolutely not. And this is another one of those cuts that we were talking about earlier that just reduces the overall confidence, which is the glue that holds together the global monetary system and therefore the global economy. But you go back to GFC 1.0, we'll call it, and the discount window was being used to the tune, I've got the chart in front of me up here on the whiteboard, to the tune of about $100 billion. That's when we got to the peak of the, of the insanity in 2008, the discount window was being used about $100 billion. And so during COVID, and I, I'm sorry, guys, I don't have my glasses on. It was used to the tune of about 55 billion. Okay. That was the the peak. And just the other day, it got up to 160 billion. So very close to double uh, the usage that we saw during the GFC in 2008. So that that in and of itself should tell you uh, how precarious 
the uh, the world is right now. And this is not just the United States. Uh, this is a problem that we could see. You know, we see Credit Suisse right now that had to be taken over by uh, by USB. And I, I think again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the headache uh, before you get hit with that with that brain tumor, or this is just the first few initial waves before you get hit by that tsunami. Our guest today is George Gammon, the rebel capitalist. We'll have more from George when we come back, and we'll play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Alps. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Real Estate Guys listeners, are you tired of losing real estate deals due to financing issues? Have you had enough of waiting on banks, lenders, and investor groups to fund new projects? What if there were a way to eliminate all the hassle and invest in real estate on your own terms? I'm here to tell you there is. Patrick Donahoe here from Paradigm Life. I'm an Investopedia Top 100 Most Influential Financial Advisor, and I recently wrote a best-selling book about the financial strategy that changed my entire investment model, and the one that could change yours. To get a copy of my book for free and learn how you can maximize your real estate portfolio by acting as your own bank, send an email to mybank at realestateguysradio.com. Don't make another real estate deal without reading my book first. Email mybank at realestateguysradio.com now to get your copy for free. When it comes to successful rental property investing, it pays to be picky. Pick the right markets, pick profitable properties, and pick great property management. That's easier said than done, but we've got great news. Jerry Curran and his rock star team at Mid-South Home Buyers are going strong in Memphis, Tennessee, and Little Rock, Arkansas, too. So for a top-notch turnkey single-family home rental property, whether you're a new investor or have a large portfolio already, pick Terry Kerr and Mid-South for a truly A-plus investing experience. To learn more, send an email to Mid-South at realestateguysradio.com. That's Mid-South at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Have fun. You'll learn something. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. If you want to hang out in beautiful Belize, join me for the Belize Discovery Trip in early May. We'll have a great time, learn about an awesome real estate market, and give you some food for thought when it comes to expanding your portfolio internationally. All the details on the website at realestateguysradio.com. Under the tab that says Events. We're talking with George Gammon today, getting some insight into the banking system, what these bank failures mean, and how you can protect yourself. Before we get back to the interview with George, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question as soon as you hear the question. And thinking of the answer, fire off your guests to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. The first person that gets the answer correct gets an awesome book called Bringing Value, Solving Problems, and Leaving a Legacy, a collection of amazing stories put together by our friend Kyle Wilson. That could be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week, we had Brian London on the program. We asked this, Louisiana is the only state that doesn't have counties. What does it have instead? Well, in Louisiana, they're not called counties. They're called parishes. Happy to be heading back to Louisiana for the 49th annual New Orleans Investment Conference. Get the details by sending an email to New Orleans at realestateguysradio.com and be invited to our legendary Real Estate Guys party. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. You know, we get locked on and thinking things are always the way they've been, but this is a paradigm for you. How many U.S. states have changed their state capital? Yeah, what number of states in the U.S., just a number, have changed their state capital? Some have, some haven't. How many have changed their state capital over the years? If you think you know or just want to pick a number, send it off to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, your physical mailing address, and the answer to the question so that if you're the winner, we can send you this awesome book, Bringing Value, Solving Problems, and Leaving a Legacy. 
that's today's real estate trivia question. We've got George Gammon with us. And uh, George, appreciate uh, you taking time to help explain uh, some of this because people are confused and and worried. And, and I think the more that you understand, it doesn't mean that you know bad things aren't on the way, but it just means you can approach it calmly and, and coolly instead of freaking out. Let's face it, a run on the bank is kind of a freak out. You know, Russ's uh, favorite uh, movie of all time, It's a Wonderful Life. There's the classic scene with the run on the bank, and they managed to get through it on that day. But people are wondering, is my money safe? You know, you mentioned FDIC. So the FDIC typically insures up to $250,000. So people with account balances less than that or maybe less worried. But what about the fact that the FDIC isn't sitting on enough money to be able to remedy all these, you know, banks if there were to be a problem. This is a great point. And I remember the last uh, summit that we did last year. This is pretty much the theme. Yeah. I mean, when I was there with with, with Kiyosaki and uh, all the wonderful speakers you had there, we were talking about these these curves. We were talking about the additional risk. And we were talking about maybe having some more dry powder to take advantage of whatever happens and not be a victim. Yeah. Uh, that's what we have to understand is the, the, the worse 2023 is going to be, the more opportunity it's going to present for, for those people who are prepared. And so how, how do you do that outside the FDIC limit? Let's say you got $10 million. It's very easy. T-bills. Do what the pros do. Buy T-bills. And this is something I've been talking about with uh, you know, the subscribers in Rebel Capital is Pro. We've been talking about it at Rebel Capital Live. I'm sure you guys have been talking about it. If you've got a ton of money in a bank, first and foremost, diversify. Yeah. And and secondly, um, whatever money you need in addition or whatever money you have that you don't need for working capital, for heaven's sakes, just put it into T-bills and, and roll it over. And there, the counterparty risk is the government instead of the banking system. And it's what all those tech companies, quite frankly, should have done that had deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, but they didn't do because they were completely asleep at the wheel. And so, but th this brings up, I think, a, a much more important point, Robert. Yeah. Because assuming we do have more of these problems that show up in terms of addis additional perceived risk to depositors, because you're, you're right, you know, the FDIC has, let's say, 150 billion, something like that. And they could have handled. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, they, they, in fact, they they did handle Silicon Valley Bank and the depositors there and signature and whatnot. But there's let's say 18 trillion in deposits. They they they, they can't handle that. So now what we have is an implied FDIC limit of infinity. Right. Because all of these depositors that should not have been bailed out uh, because they're over the FDIC limit did get bailed out. So. A lot of people, average Joes and Janes, would say, well, George, that's a good thing because people shouldn't have to worry about their bank going under. They shouldn't have to worry about these bank runs. I mean, aren't we sophisticated enough to where we can put this type of activity and this type of risk behind us? And this is something that we had to deal with in the 1930s, for heaven's sakes. Something we had to deal with in the 1800s. Okay, it's 2020 now. It's 2023. You know, can't with all the digital technology that we have, can't we figure out a way to where people don't have to worry about their bank going under or taking all of these precautionary measures like buying T-bills? This is a very da dangerous narrative, very, very dangerous. And it's something that I would encourage your listeners to think through and really push back against. Yeah. Why? Because it, you have to look at the slippery slope you're on. If people start saying, okay, well, the depositors should have no risk whatsoever. That end game, where that road leads, its logical conclusion is a central bank digital currency. Well, why is that? Because a, a central bank digital currency is not a new currency. It, it's not something that they would come out and say, hey guys, we've got this new thing called FedCoin or a CBDC, we want you to start using it. No, you wouldn't even know. It's simply a dollar. It's a one dollar. It's, it's fungible. It's a dollar, and I always encourage people to do a thought experiment and ask yourself: How do you know that they don't have a CBDC right now? How do you know you're not using one? Right. Like when you go down to the local Chipotle 
or Whole Foods or whatever, put gas in your car, how do you know you're not using a CBDC? Because they haven't announced it. See, what people have to realize is that, that we already have a CBDC. It's called bank reserves. And the bank reserves that are dollar liabilities of the Fed, those effectively are a CBDC. So the banks already use these, right? So the only thing that's different is not the form of money or what we call it. It simply is the liability. It is your dollar. So if you're if you're a listener right now and you've got, let's say, $10,000 in your bank account at Wells Fargo, that $10,000 that is your asset is a liability of Wells Fargo. Okay. All a CBDC is, is that liability moving from Wells Fargo's balance sheet to the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Boom, there you go. You got a CBDC. So my concern is if people don't understand that, you know, they've, they've got the CBDC thing on their radar. For people who are advocates of freedom and liberty and free market capitalism, they've heard of this CBDC and they know that this is, this is no bueno. Uh, but I don't think they're aware of the plumbing enough to realize that if they just came out with another crisis, if, if we have another crisis here and they say, listen, we can't, we want to make the depositors whole, but we've got 18 trillion in deposits and the FDIC cannot cover that. So what we need to do is just move these deposits to a bank that cannot go bust. And you can hear the narrative now. Right? Why on earth do we have all these average Joe and Janes and businesses that we rely on to build the economy? Why do we have them, their deposits, with these commercial banks that can go bust? This doesn't make any sense. Why would we not take these deposits and move them to a bank which we know can't go bust? And there's only one bank that fits that that uh, description, and that would be the Federal Reserve. So that's how they sell it to people that haven't done the homework to realize that a CBDC is just simply just simply means that the dollars are a liability of the Federal Reserve instead of a commercial bank. And so I think that's the road we're on right now, especially when you can if you are someone that believes that we haven't seen the the, the most powerful point of that tsunami hit and you know, that's the logical end game here that they say, well, we want to secure all depositors. There's not enough in the FDIC. Therefore, let's just move all the those deposit liabilities to the Federal Reserve. And then wham, bam, people wake up and they, they don't even realize that effectively you have a central bank digital currency. A lot to think about. That is for sure. Now, Every day, practically, you're sharing thoughts and ideas, and uh, we're appreciative of that. George, I think as you look ahead, uh, the, the real question is, what kind of moves can I make? And the first, foremost, absolutely is education. The more you understand, the less freaked out you'll be, and you'll be able to stay a few steps of, ahead. And I think that's really the thing, as I, I know as we've watched you know, your star kind of rise and your listenership and viewership grow so much, it's because you're practical and, and you're not flaring people up about it. You, know, you didn't even want to use the, the word panic. So I think cooler heads will prevail. And let's face it, any change that's going to happen at a systemic you know, level is outside of any of our control. Mm. So it's not what happens, it's what you do about it. Yeah, so T-bills first and foremost, if you've got, and diversify your bank accounts, diversify your banks, if uh, you know, you're know you worried about that FDIC limit, that's number one. Yep. Then once you do that, if you're concerned about the, the future of a central bank digital currency, or again, just to be very clear, just simply those deposit liabilities going to the, the, the Fed's balance sheet, which gives them the ability to have that kind of Orwellian type of uh, power that most of us are uncomfortable with. Yep. With that, it's all about community. 100% about community. So why? Because I'm of the opinion, especially when you look at 2020, unfortunately, society, when they are in a position of fear, doesn't need to have tyranny thrust upon them. They actually demand tyranny. And this is a very scary situation. So you go back to 2020, and it's not like the initially, yes, the government did have to force this upon people as far as being locked in a cage. But then people just started demand it, demanding that they have this tyranny thrust upon them. You know, I, I demand that you lock us down even more, government, 
I demand that you force me to wear a mask. I demand that you force me to inject a, a foreign substance into the veins of my children. And I think that it's it's the same type of situation when we're talking about these depositors being at risk. They Not that they have to force people to use a central bank digital currency or that form of tyranny, but people actually demand it, the average Joe and Jane. So what that means is when you go to buy something, there would need to be some sort of point of sale software that was connected to the network because in order for the Fed to get the information, the data they need to have that Orwellian control, let's say set up a social score, uh, they would have to know that if you go to Chipotle, are you buying steak or are you buying tofu? Because steak, that goes against your creb or your carbon score or social score. Tofu, that benefits your carbon score or social score. So I think in the future, the way they'll lay that the way they'll roll this out is make it voluntary, but they'll force the businesses to have this uh, point of sale software to to collect that the nuance of the data. So it's not just about how much you spent, but it's about what you bought. Or it's, so it's, right now it's about where you bought it and how much you spent. So if you go to your Wells Fargo bank statement, you can tell if you went to Chipotle and spent 20 bucks, but you can't tell if you got steak or tofu. And so they're gonna have to implement that system. And I think what that will do is regardless of how you pay, whether you pay with gold, Bitcoin, silver, cash, uh, you have to give your fingerprint. I mean, I did a, a, a tweet today where uh, uh, Panera Bread in, in St. Louis is doing this new system where you have to pay with your palm. So you, it's something with Amazon Pay or something like that, where before you know you, you tell them what you want and you have to put your palm down and that's how you actually pay. Wow. So I, I think that we're going to see more of this in the future, which will allow those central planners to get the data they need to create that a social score along with that central bank digital currency. That's very important. So the reason that's so important for people to think through is because if they roll this out, then they're going to frown upon certain things like, let's say, diesel. That's kind of a low-lying fruit right there, right? So if you're someone that has a diesel truck, well, you need to get involved with other people that are like-minded, that have a similar worldview, that might drive a Prius, or might drive a Tesla or something like that. Because what they're gonna be able to do is max out their diesel monthly allotment and give it to you. And then you can just give them the money or you can, let's say they're a, a big meat eater. They love eating steak, but they drive a Tesla and you're a vegetarian, but you drive a big diesel truck. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, if they're in your network, if they're in your community, there's nothing that the central planners are gonna be able to do if you buy, uh, the additional meat for that individual so it doesn't impact their carbon score and they buy the additional diesel for you, you see? So a lot of people, I think, because they don't understand the mechanics behind a central bank digital currency, just think that, oh, well, I'll just pay with gold or, oh, I'll just pay with cash or, oh, I'll just pay with Bitcoin. But I think that gives people a false sense of security where I think what's most, although that's good, absolutely, to have purchasing power outside of the banking system. I think it's very important for people to own physical gold, physical silver, and to have some Bitcoin. But I don't think that's a panacea. And I think what's even more important is to have that community around you that you can depend on, that you can rely on other people, other human beings, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> uh, and, and if you have that strong community, then I think that's the best way to kind of weather the storm. Totally agree. And I think that is overlooked today with people being able to sit in their house and Zoom and still locked down out of social situations and all that. I mean, it's getting better, but it really is about community. We love that. Speaking of community, your community is getting together for Rebel Capitalist Live. Super excited to be with you there in uh, beautiful Orlando, Florida. That is coming up in May. Tell us about some of the folks you have coming to Rebel Capitalist Live. Yeah, well, thanks for asking, Robert. You're going to be emceeing, so I'm super excited about that. I'm sure Russ is going to be there. We'll have him do a panel discussion uh, like we did last time. Uh, we've got guys like Peter Schiff is going to be there. I'm sure your audience have, has heard of him. Also, Mike Maloney. We're very excited to have Mike there. We've done about four of these Rebel Capitalists, and it's the first time that we've had Mike at a show. We're going to have Lynn Alden 
We're going to have Brent uh, Johnson. We're going to have Jeff Snyder. We're going to have Robert Barnes, who uh, is the the lawyer I'm using with the, the lawsuit that we have against uh, the Federal Reserve. And uh, we've got Kenny McElroy. Your audience might be familiar with him. <laughs> and, and several others. So if people go to, maybe you'll have a link on your website. Yeah, if you want to come to the event, it it's it's two days and it's extraordinary. And not only are the speakers first rate, and if you were at all enticed by our conversation today, you're going to want to get around some of these smart people. But also the attendees are just great. The people that show up back to building community and building tribe were, as you know, big fans of that. All you have to do to learn more is uh, send an email to RCL, like Rebel Capitalist Live, RCL at realestateguysradio.com. You get all the details about the event. Come hang out with us. Can't wait for it, my friend. Thanks so much, George. Yeah, thanks for having me on. There's George Gammon. You can find out more when you send your email to Rebel Capitalist Live. So that's RCL. Just use those three letters, RCL, at realestateguysradio.com. Not only will you get a link to sign up to the event and learn more about it, but we'll tell you all things George Gammon. He's got amazing whiteboard videos. He's very prolific out there uh, on the podcast world. And I just really appreciate the work that he does. When we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year so you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon. And now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a U-bit time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill U-bit, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com today. Stop for a moment. Why are you listening to this show? Are you dreaming of a bigger, brighter financial future? More personal freedom to live life on your own terms? What if there was just one skill that could make it happen? There is. Sales. Robert Kiyosaki says every entrepreneur must be good at sales. It's true for investors too. Sales is how you attract money, people, and opportunities. Sales is the skill used to negotiate deals and lead your team. Sales skills are essential to success. The good news is it's a learnable skill. The great news is we've created a two-day interactive workshop to teach those skills to you. Make plans today to attend How to Win Funds and Influence People, Mastering the Art of Financial Selling. For dates and details, send an email to sales at realestateguysradio.com or visit realestateguysradio.com and look under events. Gain the skills you need to succeed. Email sales at realestateguysradio.com or look under the events tab at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, I'm Nomi Prince, author of Collusion. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into this show. It's not too late to get your spot on the 21st annual Investor Summit on Sand. All the details on the website at realestateguysradio.com under Summit. Well, I always learn something every single time I talk to George Gammon. It reminds me when I first met Peter Schiff. When I first met Peter, he would talk so fast. George doesn't talk fast. George is a very clear, methodical communicator. Peter just goes, and he's got so much passion. And he just lays down these concepts, and he just understands the system and the terminology and the flow so well. It's really kind of like an engineering project because all of these pieces of the financial system, the currency, the banking system, the bond market, uh, they're all interconnected. And one factor changes other things. And there's these dashboards that all these wonky people look at, like the yield curve, like what's going on in spreads. 
Uh, there's a lot of things like that. And you think to yourself, gosh, could I ever understand that stuff? And I'm just here to tell you as a guy that has spent a lot of time really getting my mind around it so that I could just understand what I was reading in the daily news. Because what I found out when I went back and reverse engineered 2008 is all of the warning signs, everything you needed to know about what was about to happen was in the news. I just didn't know what any of it meant. Right. And I know that that's going on for a lot of people right now. So when you hear a guy like George go off into these wonky discussions about the inner workings of the system and what it means, I just encourage people, don't be discouraged. Just give give your intellect uh, the benefit of the doubt and trust that if you will dig in and pay attention and really think it through, it will start to make sense because all of it is truly just rooted in human behavior. And if you're a human being, you understand behavior. There's greed and fear. There's risk on and risk off. And when you understand that, then when people are afraid, they move into certain asset classes, treasuries, for example. It was easy to see that when people in Silicon Valley Bank got scared of their deposits being over the $250,000 limit, they moved their money. Yeah. And then if you see that coming as their risk managers, according to George, should have seen, then you would know that they would probably either move them into treasuries or they would move it into uh, other banks they deemed that were safer. And then when the Federal Reserve comes out and says, oh, or the Treasury, Janet Yellen comes out and says, oh, we're going to guarantee all deposits or only deposits at the big banks, you know what people are going to start to do. And when you can understand the way the mechanics work and human behavior, then you begin to understand where the flow of capital will go and what boats will rise and what boats will sink. And in the real estate world, because I do want to come back to earth, just what does all this mean to real estate investors? He talked about the 10-year treasury. Treasuries are very important because especially the 10-year treasury, when money flows into the treasuries, it drops interest rates. And that's why when people got scared in Silicon Valley Bank, you saw mortgage rates drop because they're indexed to the 10-year treasury. And if you know that and you're in the middle of a transaction... You're trying to decide, should I lock my rate? Should I refinance? You know, is now a good time? When you see fear in the marketplace, you're going to see money moving into bonds and that money driving the price of the bond up, driving the yield down, and that will reflect in mortgage rates. Conversely, if we go to a Fed pivot and the Fed starts to lower interest rates, you think, oh, that's going to be good for mortgages, but it's risk on and people are going to take their money out of the bond market into the stock market to chase the gains from low interest rates. And it actually can have the opposite effect. You might see mortgage rates go up. But once you understand it, and of course, I'm talking mortgage rates because I come out of that side of the business and that's what I used to pay attention to. But it's a much, much bigger world. It's about the economy, the banking system, the credit market, the stock market, precious metals. And you can begin to take corrective action or you can begin to take preemptive action to ride a wave or avoid a tsunami, as George calls it, simply by understanding the mechanics. It's that important. That's why all the financial mainstream media guys talk about it, obsess over it, write about it all the time. And Main Street investors just haven't gotten clued in yet Uh, to how important it is that they pay attention to. I think we've been on the front end of that over the last 10 years, and it's good to see a guy like George come on. Of course, he's way smarter than me, even though he started later. I'm slow, Uh, but I (laughs) learn so much every time he talks. It's just he really, really gets it. He sure does, and if you want to learn more about what George Gammon does and how you can plug in, just send an email to rcl, like Rebel Capitalist Live, rcl at realestateguysradio.com. And come on out to Orlando. You'll get to hang out with us and Peter Schiff and the rebel capitalist himself. It's going to be an extraordinary couple of days out there. There's a lot to talk about. The median home price down for the first time in over a decade. We've got employment changing drastically. Everything that's happening in the bank. Stay tuned. We'll bring to you what we can. And in the coming weeks, it's going to be fun. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at BeYourBank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers. Low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct. Asset protection strategies for real estate investors. From attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. 
Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.